<laughs> Dear Play That Song, go ahead and click the button. Uh, watch the volume. Hey, did, I did do a sound check tonight, so I don't know where any of the volumes are at. Sing this in a little bit. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not. That is fun. But then I heard my Savior speaking. Draw from my way that never shall run dry. Ecclesiastes, and I'm going to start in first chapter, and then first Corinthians 10. Now, the thing is, is what does motivate us? You know, I, I've spoke a lot on different uh, different ways that, that we do things, uh, different teachings. And 
I've talked about motivation in the past. You know, Matthew 5, during the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord asks, why do you do what you do for me? He says, when you go out, when you go pray, do you pray as the Pharisees do? Standing on top of the, the, the temple, raising your hands and shouting so that every man can see you. Or do you go into your prayer closet and do it in quiet? Do you keep do you let your right hand know what your left is doing? Or when you give your your gifts, your alms, are you doing it so that men can see you, or are you just doing it so that your Father in heaven can see you? Now what motivates us? Are we motivated by fear? You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 3, fear the Lord. Hey, what kind of fear are we talking about? You know, are we afraid? Do we do what we do because we're afraid that if we don't, God's going to strike us. He's going to put us in the woodshed. And we all know what the woodshed is about. Or are we motivated by His blessings? You know, the question I have is, if we didn't have to worry about the consequences, if we didn't have to worry about the punishment and there was going to be no blessing, would we still live the way we do today? Because that's what's going to determine what our, what our motivating factor is. Are we doing it because God's going to bless us? Is that the only reason we're doing what we're doing so that God can bless us? Are we doing it because we're afraid that God's going to punish us? If, we're, if that's the only thing we're looking at, I think maybe we're motivated wrong. I had a pastor friend of mine who used to say, I don't, it wouldn't matter if God existed today or not, I would still live the same way I live right now because it makes sense. If you look at the Bible, what does it teach? It teaches love your brother. Think of your brother more than think of yourself. It teaches... To give unto others. To respect yourself, but do it in a meek and humble manner. What more can we ask for in life? You know, a, fr a friend of mine says, if, if you did the do's in the Bible, the Bible has do's and don'ts. If you did all the do's in the Bible, you would never have to worry about the don'ts. So, the question I've been pondering, and I've been doing this for a couple of weeks because... You know, really, it, the motivational core of who we are is what determines what kind of Christian we're going to be. It, de it determines what kind of person we're going to be. Now, there's two different views. Now, Solomon, he, he was looking at it one way. Now, Solomon, everybody knows he was the wisest king in all of Israel. Even today, philosophers consider him one of the wisest men to ever walk the face of the earth. Now, they won't acknowledge the fact that he taught of God, they still look at his, the secular world looks at him and says, you know what, Solomon was a wise man, but we don't like what he taught. But he had wisdom. And he looks at, in the first verse of Ecclesiastes 1.1, 1, 1, the words of the preacher, the son of David and the king of Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What is the profit to a man in all his labor, which labors under the sun? A generation passes away and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun also arises and the sun goes down and hurries to its place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and it turns around to the north. It whirls around continually and wind returns on its surface. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full to the place from where the rivers come. They, and they, there they return again. All the things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which man is, that which he shall be, that which shall have, which has been done, is that which shall be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. And there is a thing of which I may be said, see, this is new. It has already been done, been in the days of old, which are before us. There is no memory of former things, and also no memory after things, which shall be, for neither shall a remembrance of them with those who will be at the afterwards. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things done under the heavens. It is a sad task. God has given to the Son of Man to be humbled by it. 
I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. Behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, if you look at the way Solomon is looking at this, he's saying, you know what? I've been around. You know, I've been king over Jerusalem, and he was king, what, 40, 50 years? And at this time, he had been that king for a good period of time, and he had been able to search out certain things using wisdom. And, you know, he says, no matter what I see, what's been done, none of it's any good. He says it's all vanity. He goes on later to say that, you know, he got to the point where he hated life because nothing he did made a difference. So is wisdom the reason or the motivation for us to do what we do every day? God says we need it. God says we're required to be wise, wise as serpents, as we go out into the world. But is that motivation enough for us to get up? Is that motivation enough for you, Pastor, to get up every day and come in here when your pain level is either at a zero or at a 25 on a scale to 10 and stand behind this pulpit and give the word? Do you do it for wisdom's sake? I don't think so. Do we do it because, you know what, it makes me look good to be standing up here saying all this stuff. I don't think so. You know, I've been accused of putting my life out there for people to see. And I've been told from time to time that, you know, if I do that too often, then, that you all are going to throw me down. But here's the thing. I don't care. I'm not worried about what you all think about me. There's a reason for that. God didn't put me up here to care what people think. God put me up here to speak a word. I put my life out there, not, as, not so that you guys can pity me or adore me or like me or hate me. I do it because my life is an example. If God can work the miracles he did in my life, bringing me from the gutter, from an alcoholic, drug addict, well, I wasn't really a drug addict, I was a drug user, but I was an alcoholic, a porn addict, take me out of that gutter, pick me up, stick me in this church, and eventually bring me to the pulpit. He can work a miracle in any one of you, anybody's life out there. That's an example of hope. That says, you know what, I don't care what your grandkids, what your kids, what your nephews, what your nieces, what anyone else is doing, there is hope for them today. If he can do it in my life, he can do it in theirs. And yeah, there's, there's people worse off than me out there. I know. But I guarantee you, I was one of the worst of the worst out there at some point in time. And yet God saw fit to say, Jim, I love you enough that I'm going to pick you up by your hair and drag you out of that gutter that you put yourself in because you walked away from me and I'm going to put you up at a pulpit so that you can give your witness. What is our Bible? Is it not the witness of those men that walk with Christ saying, you know what, Christ did this, Christ said that. That's his witness. That, that book it is a testimony saying, hey, this is what Christ did for me. Saul says, I was his chief among all sinners, and yet Christ saw fit to take me out of that, period, that place that I was in and put me up as chief of apostles. Now, one of our, now, you know, I've said it before, there isn't a biblical character or a, a man in the Bible or an apostle that wasn't as messed up, it wasn't perfect when he came to God. He was as messed up as the rest of us, it's not more so. God chose to show his glory through those that are broken. Yes, if you're not broken and God doesn't fix you, what's the glory in it? So why do we do what we do? Why is it that we get up in the morning and we pray to God? Are we just seeking His blessings? Or are we just afraid that if we don't, that God's going to punish us that day? You know, I used to be afraid. You know, like I say, my perception of God was this. 
if, if I messed up, God was sitting up there with a lightning bolt like the old statue of Zeus, and he was just waiting for me to mess up. And when I did, zap! And believe me, my life, my life fell apart. He, you know, and I blame God for it, but you know what? The truth of the matter is, it wasn't God that tore my life apart. It was me. God allowed it to happen, but I was the one that actually did it. I tell you, we got freedom of choice. When I walked away from God, God says, Okay. I'm going to let Satan have his, little, his way with you for a little while. Because I'm going to teach you a lesson. So, yeah. But, you know, we can go too far in the, the other extreme. We can start using God as that ATM. Yeah. Saying, God, the only reason I'm serving you is so that you can bless me. We talk about heaven. Yes, that's a reward. You know, that's something we strive for. But if it's the only reason that we're doing this, we have a problem. So what is the purpose? Now, we go further in. We go to the third chapter. Now, I was going to go into the second chapter of Ecclesiastes, but I'm going to jump right to the third. It says to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pull up, what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn. You get the point. There's a time for everything. Solomon went through everything. He was very meticulous in his writings. And he says, no matter what, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. So when I go to work tonight, you know, I'm not going to, I can't say that because I stood up here and I did what God told me to do. I did as well. That I'm going to go to work and it's going to be a perfect night. Because I don't know that. I, I, I have sat up here at this pulpit and preached the message that God told me and went to work and had the worst night of my life. And then I turn around and ask God, uh, yo, Why? Points right to it. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. So if we're just looking for the blessings, if we're just looking for that, if we're using God as that ATM machine and we're doing what we're doing just for that, when those blessings don't come and we end up in that, that rainy season, even though we're, we're doing what He tells us to do, there's a possibility that we're going to say, you know what, it ain't worth it no more. It ain't worth it, you know. I, I do what you ask me to do. And things, my life is still falling apart around me. My kids are still yelling at me. They're still creating a, you know, havoc at the house. My work is a mess. So, Lord, I just don't need it. And you can walk away. If that's all we're looking for is his blessings. And if we're just looking for, if we're just afraid of his punishment, then eventually we're going to bring it down upon ourselves. Because if, we, if we're motivated from fear, that doesn't help us. Now, if you go over to the 10th chapter of Corinthians. Now, we all know that the Corinthian church was in a sorry state of affairs when Paul was talking to him. He wrote two letters to him. Neither one of them were nice. He was chastising him. Their, their, their church was in a very bad state. In fact, when I was down there... Uh, doing my examination for my ministerial license. Uh, Reverend Morgan well, on the board, he said, we were talking about speaking in the tongues. And he looks at me and says, Jim, if you're fashioning yourself after the Corinthian church, you're in a world of hurt. Because that was the most goofed up church that, I, that they've ever seen. They had fornicators. They had guys out there messing around with their, somebody, with their father's wives. They had things going on in their church that was totally unbelievable. And Paul was writing this letter to them. And he looks at them. And one of the problems they were having is they had a very legalist view. One of them, half, the, half of them were, uh, how do I say this? Half of them were looking at it from a pharisaical point of view being very legalistic, and half of them were being very liberal. So they're sitting there, and they're talking about eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. 
And, you know, if you're from a pharisaical point of view, a very legalistic point of view, you say, nah, it can't happen. Won't, won't happen. Can't do it. Won't do it. Don't even think about it. The other group said, you know what? I don't care what it's sacrificed to. That's good stuff. And I'm going to eat it. So there was, a, there was a little bit of a division in the church. And Paul writes to him and says, hey, let's settle this. Let's settle this the right way. And he starts out in... In the first verse. And he says, Brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. He says, first thing he says, I don't want any of you to be ignorant. We're, we're going to start talking this, but I don't want you to be ignorant. Now, ignorant is one of those words that we turned into a cuss word. You know, you walk down the street, a guy goes over there and he does something silly and he says, Why are you so ignorant? Ignorant means lack of knowledge. It's not a cuss word. It means that I am unknowing of what's happening. I am unknowing of what's supposed to be. You know, we take cuss words and take them and make them everyday usage, and then we take everyday usage words and make them cuss words. America is messed up. We truly are in our language. <laughs> so it says, I don't want you to be ignorant. And he says, that all passed through the sea and all that were baptized in Moses and clouded the sea and all ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink and they drank the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. But many of them, God was not well pleased for they were scattered into the wilderness and these things were our examples that we should not be lusters after evil they, as they also lusted. Nor should we be idolaters. Even as some of them, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose to, up to play. Nor let us commit fornication as some fornicated, and 23,000 fell in one day. So Paul is going back and he's saying, hey, you know what, this is, this is your past. This is Israel's past. And you guys may be Gentiles, but you know what? When you came to Christ and you said, God, forgive me, you became a Jew. You were grafted in. That is part of our heritage, our, our birthright as Christians. And I'm not talking about our natural birth, I'm talking about our spiritual birth. We were grafted in to be one of his chosen people. And you know, that's, that, that's a benefit. That's something we need to stand up and shout about. We're, you know, we're, we're part of God's chosen people. Amen. So he, he goes down a little further. He says, nor should we be idolaters, let us not commit fornication, nor let us tempt Christ, and some, as some of them also tempted him, was destroyed by serpents. So he keeps going on. Nor murmur, and some also murmur, and destroyed by the destroyer. And we're going to drop down to the 12th verse. So it says, so let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is taking you but what is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted by what you are able. But with temptation, also will make a way of escape, so that you may be able to bear it. So, he starts talking about the past. How the children of Israel were baptized into Moses. you know, And that they, they ate the spiritual food and drank the spiritual drink that they drank when they were out in the wilderness. And, you know, the manna is spiritual. So was the, the water from the rock. You know, Moses went over there and smoked the rock a couple times, water came flowing out. I wouldn't call that natural water. So he's saying they did certain things, but yet they also turned around and did other things that made God very displeased with them. So here we go, walking into the punishment aspect. So, you know, we've got to be careful here. But he says, you know what? He says, but there's one thing. No matter what you go through, there is no temptation taking you, which is not which is common to man, that God can, is not able to take care of. And he, when you go through these temptations, God is going to give you a way out. That way you're able to bear it. So as we're going through these things, as we're trying to figure out what it is that's motivating us, the one thing we don't have to worry about is fear. 
Because God's going to make us capable of going through whatever it is that we're going through and give us a way out when it gets, it gets too tough. Because God, the potter knows the clay. When God formed us, when God formed me, he knew exactly what he was making. He put pressure in the right spot to make me who I am today. And he made me for his purpose, not mine. Okay? So it says, Therefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry, speak as wise men. You judge what I say. The cup of blessing we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is not the communion of the body of Christ. For we, the many, are one bread and one body, for we are partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not those who eat of the sacrifices also per what he, what he goes on to say is he's talking about the, these these idols and how when they're out there that, you know, sometimes you go to the meat market and uh, you go to go to take some and some of those those meats may have been sacrificed to idols. And, you know, as a Christian, we can't eat that stuff. You know, we're supposed to be we're supposed to flee temptation. We're supposed to flee those things that are wrong in appearance. It says in the 21st verse, You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Paul goes on to say, All things are legal for me, or lawful, but not all things profit. All things are lawful to me, but not all things build up. You know, he says this twice in his book. Once in the sixth chapter, once in the tenth. And the one thing I've learned about the Bible is anytime it starts repeating itself, it's something to be aware of. It's something you need to take note of. When Paul says all things are lawful to me, he's saying, you know what? I'm capable, God, God gave me freedom, so I, I'm capable of doing anything I want to do. He gave me choice, so I can do what I want to do. And I've said before, it doesn't matter what we do. We, if, if we want to go out and play in the road, God says you can go out and play in the road. I'm free to do that, but I'm not free of the consequences if that car runs me over. That's why he says, all things are lawful to me. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. But all things don't build up. So that's, that's the part that, would, that kind of puts things in, in order. He goes on to further say, he says, if, if you go down further in it, he says, if, you, if you're invited to go somewhere and the people ask you, say, hey, here's, here, here's your plate of food. He says, don't ask where it came from. It says, don't ask where it came from, for your conscience sake. Okay? Because it, it doesn't matter if it was sacrificed to an idol or not. If you're not asking, it's not going to hurt you. Because your God is able to take care of you. It says, don't ask, for your conscience sake. But he says this. He says, if they say, hey, this was sacrificed to this idol, it says, don't touch it. For their sake. So what is the motivation behind this? You know, you guys are going, okay, what are you getting at, Jim? You know, it says, Paul's state makes a very simple statement. He says, let no one seek his own but each other's. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions. If those who do not believe invite you to a feast and you're supposed to go, Eat what's before you. It says, I say, not, ah, let's go. But if anyone says you is slain in, sac in sacrifice to idols, do not eat for the sake of him who showed it for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and fullness of it. I missed it. For why is my liberty judged by another's conscience? 
Okay, here we go. Paul says all things are lawful, not all things build up. He says, why is it that my liberty, what I'm free to do, what God says, hey, you know what, you're free to do, is hindered by somebody else's conscience. Why is it hindered by somebody else's conscience? Why do we do what we do? Are we praying for ourselves? Are we getting up and preaching the word for ourselves? Are we doing it because we're afraid of what God might do to us? Are we doing it because what He will do for us? Are we doing it because it's the right thing to do? He says in the 31st verse, and this is one of the core texts, this is therefore whatever you, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's the motivation we're looking for. Whether or not he's going to bless me because I stand up here and preach the word or sing the songs he tells me to sing, or whether or not he's going to punish me if I don't, doesn't matter. As long as I'm standing up here and I'm doing it for his glory, regardless of what I receive in the end. Do all things for the glory of God. All things. And whatever we do. So if we're getting out of bed and we go on to pray and we're doing it for His glory, we're right. If we're getting up and we're doing it because He might see me do it and you know what makes me look good, I think we're a little bit wrong. If we're doing it for man's sake, if I'm going to work and say, hey, you know what, I'm the assistant pastor at church and I'm doing it because I want people to think and respect me more, I'm wrong. If I'm doing it to open up the door so that they can come talk to me with their problems and I can lead them into a fuller explanation of Christ, then I'm doing it for the right reason. For I'm doing it for their conscience sake, not mine. That's why I, when I come up here I say, I don't care what you all think because that's not what God put me here for. He put me here so that I can be an example of hope for, your, for the people in your lives, if I can be that hope for them, then I've done my job. Because I'm doing it for His glory, not for mine. Whether I sing the song perfectly, or I sing it like I did tonight with a little bit of you know, throat problems, I'm going to sing the song because He told me to, and I'm going to sing it for His glory. Because there are millions in the world that are still out there seeking these pleasures. There are those people in our lives that are looking for something that they can't find. And we're the only light that they, that they have to bring them into the fold. And as long as we're doing what we're doing for God's sake, He's going to bring them into our lives and He's going to bring them to, into a fuller explanation of it. But if we're doing it for our own motivation, our own agendas, then there's going to be a problem. Because when you start doing things for your own agenda, that's when things fall apart. And when they fall apart, you not only take yourself, but those people that you are the example to, you take them with you. That's why I say it's hard for my son to trust a Christian because he trusted the pastor of that church that we were going to and when he walked in and heard them practicing the speaking in tongues and the interpretations thereof, he lost faith. He says, how can God be real if they have to practice the Spirit? And you know he's never set foot in a church again. So when we falter, when we fall, it's the people out there that are looking out at us and that are, that are watching our example, when we fall, we take them with you. Or we take, take them with us. Look at Jimmy Swagger. I, 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 I was an avid fan of Jimmy Swagger as I was growing up, but when he fell, he took a lot of people with him. And a lot of people, a lot of them people had never came back. So if you're going to stand up in front of people, be sure that your motivation is right. Make sure that you're doing it for God's glory, not for yours. If you're doing it for your own glory, I think you need to step, sit down, shut up, and pray. God, 
God was talking through today. He was talking about crying unto God. David's prayer. Oh, hear me, O oh, merciful God. Oh, hear my cry. And here, why are we crying? What's our motivation for that prayer? You know, his son, Solomon, he said one thing when he ended his, his, his book, The Preacher, in Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. It says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole purpose of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, and every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. He's going to bring it all light. He may do it as we're sitting here on this earth. Or he may do it when we're standing in front of judgment. But he's going to bring it to light sooner or later. And I'm going to close with this reading. This is uh, Charles Spurgeon. Our hope is in Christ for the future is the mainspring and mainstay of our joy here. It will animate our hearts to think often of heaven. So there are benefits and there are rewards to being a Christian. You know, our motivation can't be just heaven. It has to be God's glory. But you know what? There is a reward. So we, we, we can still dwell on that fact. You know what? I want to go to heaven. I don't want to stay here. In fact, that whole series of prophecy led to one ultimate thing. The best is yet to come. Yeah. And as long as we're walking away and we're ready for what we're, we're coming to, we're going to sit at his feet. And he says our hope and for all that we can desire is promised there. Here we are weary and toil worn, but yonder is the land of rest where sweat of labor shall no more bestow, be due the worker's brow, and fatigue shall be ever banished. To those who are weary and spent, the word rest is full of heaven. We are always in the field of battle. We are so tempted within and so molested by foes without that we have little or no peace. But in heaven we shall enjoy the victory. When the banner shall be waved, the loft and trumpet, in triumph, and the sword shall be sheathed, and we shall hear our captain say, Well done, good and faithful servant. We have suffered bereavement after bereavement, but we are going to the land of immortal, of the immortal, where graves are an unknown thing. Here sin is a constant grief to us, but there we shall be perfectly holy. For there shall by by no means enter into that kingdom anything which defiled. Hemlock springs not up in the furrows of celestial fields. Oh, it is not joy that you are not to be in banishment forever, that you are not to dwell eternally in this wilderness, but shall soon inherit Canaan. Nevertheless, let it never be said of us that we are dreaming about the future and forgetting the present. Let the future sanctify the present to its highest uses. For though the Spirit of God, the hope of heaven, is the most potent force for the product of virtue, it is the found, fountain of joyous effort. It is the cornerstone of cheerful holiness. The man who has this hope in him goes about the work, his work with <laughs> vigor. For the joy of the Lord is his strength. He fights against temptation with ardor, for the hope of the next world repels the fiery darts of the adversary. He can labor without present reward, for he looks for a reward in the world to come. We seek that which is coming. We don't expect what we're getting now. I know when you were talking to your sister, you were not expecting what you heard these last couple days. It was a blessing. It was a relief. It was a reason to go on. Sometimes, you know, especially as preachers, we, we get to seeing what's going on around us. 
And sometimes we sit down in despair. You know, I, I was when I when I was setting up this sermon, I was sitting down and I was gonna go a totally different route because I was so I was I was in despair. Sometimes we look out and we say the words and we don't see what we want to see. We don't see the hope in people's eyes. We don't see the renewal. And it causes us to wonder, are we actually having an effect? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? And if that was the reason, if that was the only reason that I got out of bed in the morning, the only reason I come up to this, this pulpit and spoke the word, then I would be gone. Because God says, it's not for you to know. It's not your purpose to see what's going on out there. It's your purpose to say what I told you to say and say what I told you to say and let me do the work that I'm going to do. Because it's not my work that counts as His. All I can do is speak the message and let Him do what He's going to do through His Spirit. And I know the pastor gets in that despairing mode sometimes. And I, I've heard it in his voice. I've heard it in his ministry. I've heard it when he's up here. But we, try, we go on because it's not us. It's not our glory that we're seeking. It's his. And as we go out this week, and we go out into the world, and the world is a dark and dangerous place for us, and it's getting darker and it's getting more dangerous. As the end times come, the darkness is going to get darker and it's become more dangerous for Christians. The Bible says it's going to. Until the time of the rapture, as things progress. But as we go out into that thing, if we're seeking His motivation, if we're seeking His glory, God's going to take care of us. If we're, if we're just doing this through emotion, emotional response, we're not going to make it. But if we're doing it through faith and perseverance, then there's nothing we can't do. You know, we, we sing the songs, To God be the glory. To God be the glory. And that's the way it should be. You know, I, I, I hate it when my own words come back to haunt me. <coughs> I had a chance, I was sitting down and I was cleaning out my computer. I've been videotaping here for oh, about three years now. I've got over a thousand video files. That's a lot. But I happened to click on my computer and I went to an old sermon that I had preached. And the word was, are you listening? And you know, sometimes I sit down and, and, and I, I get to doing what I'm doing. And you know what? I forget to listen to what God's saying to us today. And then as I went down through and I clicked on another one and I saw Mike. And I'm going, okay, which one is this? And it says, the voice of God. You remember that one? It was from this last revival. The voice of God. The seven thunders. The psalm of the seven thunders. God's voice speaking as a thunder. And that's why he's speaking to us today. That's what he's saying today. Sit down. Listen to the voice of God. And do it for my glory. And I will make everything that you do prosper. It may not prosper the way you want it to. It's not going to make you rich. If you're looking for riches, you're looking in the wrong spot. I don't think the pastor has, you know, a couple hundred bucks to roll together. But I guarantee you, the peace and the love and the faith in those things, if we are rich in those things, we're rich in all things. Amen. It's not the money that counts. I'm sure a couple hundred bucks would be nice to put in your pocket every now and then. Make life a little easier, but it's not going to make you happy and it's not going to get you to heaven. 
So as we go out there, be careful. Be careful why you're doing things. Check your motivation daily. Check it with the Word. You know, if we're not getting into this Word and into our Word on a daily basis, we're losing out what God has to say to us. And God has a word for each and every one of us every day. And he puts it out there so that we can do a work out there. My church isn't here. This is where I get fed. My church is Plastifoam because that's where God sent me to minister. My church is my living room where I sit down and teach my kids even though they're not listening and they, they just they try to ignore me as much as possible but what it is to be a Christian. My church is outside these walls. This is my family. This is my home. This is where my father feeds me at his table. This is where he gives me rest for the week to come. But there's my church. And we're all ministers out there. Every one of us has a ministry out there. And if we're not doing that. You know, I, I was reading, I was going through the website. And uh, the Master's Way is one of our resources on there. And it had a quote from Charles Spurgeon. It says, if we're not worried about the lost, if we're not paying attention, if we're not... How did he put it? He says, if we're not, I'm just going to say worried about the status of lost souls, then we're not saved. How can you be a Christian and not worry about those people out there? If we're not worried about lost souls, then we're just pew sitters. We're just mouthpieces for I don't know what. We're just sitting here soaking up something that we, we're not going to use. So as we're going out there this week, as we go through life, <clears throat> be sure we're doing it for the right reasons. If we're taking our kids, the Bible says if, you're, if someone asks you to go a mile, go two. If he asks you for a coat, give him a cloak also. But if we're doing it just for any other reason than God's glory, then we need to check our attitude and check our motivation. We need to check that which we're doing and say, God, forgive me and help me do better. If everyone will close their eyes and bow their heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight and I thank you for this time that we've had, Lord. I thank you for the word that you've given me. Lord, I gave it to you I gave it the best I could. Lord, I know there's a purpose and a plan for everything that you do. And I know that your love is here to surround us and to keep us going. <coughs> Lord, give us hope to go through this week. Give us strength and give us peace that we may be able to handle what's out there. Lord, Give us the wisdom that we need to deal with those situations that will arise. Help us to do your will and do it for your reason, for your glory, and not our own. Lord, I ask that as we go our separate ways tonight, that you give us traveling mercies so that we can come back to your table. Lord, I ask this in thy holy name. Amen.